Good morning, Thursday, I don't know, I'm guessing 20, 21st maybe of May, that was a guess. I hope that everyone is well and thank you for tuning in. <clears throat> a few minutes of how lovely that is. So, good morning. It is Thursday morning and this week, month of May, is Mental Health Week. And in the UK, month of May is Mental Health, so we're doing a Mental Health Week vlog. And we started on Monday with A for Anxiety, B for borderline personality, C for codependency, and today we're on D for depression. So, there are many beliefs around depression, and if I was to ask you as a collective group, what do you think depression is? I'm harvoring a guess that a high percentage of you would say depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain. And that's what we've been taught to believe that and some of us haven't even been taught that some of that's, that information has just been imparted on us so <clears throat> although there are significant biological factors for depression there are also a number of other factors that seem to be going under the radar so a chemical imbalance in the brain okay so you go and you go to see a doctor they write your prescription you take pharmaceutical medication now, that pharmaceutical medication on a whole is an SSRI. Um, that SSRI um, increases the amount of serotonin in the brain and people feel better. Now, we, we were taught to believe that that increase in serotonin is what was making the client or the individual feel better. Now, if you look at recent research, it's perhaps a secondary chemical that's being created, or indeed the increase of serotonin, that creates neurogenesis in the brain, that if we look at people that have been highly stressed for a prolonged period of time, and that could be post-traumatic stress disorder, or an executive that's experienced burnout because of stress, or you look at the brain of a depressed person, what you will notice on that slice shot is that the hippocampus, the hippocampus, it's not like hippopotamus, but hippocampus, if you want to research that, depression in the hippocampus. And what you found is that the hippocampus of a depressed person is significantly smaller than somebody that's feeling active and in flow. Now, what some of these SSRI, these antidepressant drugs, although they were increasing serotonin, which was making the individual feel better rather than being depressed, what the chemicals that were being released by this antidepressant was also doing was also creating and stimulating new cell growth, new synaptic growth, and creating new connections in the brain and allowing what was called neurogenesis. Okay, so... Um, depression for the majority of us have been led to believe that depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain now I have personally never sat fully in that camp I have generally always had sort of one foot or one toe in that belief system but I have always found that I wanted to research other indicative markers of depression such as inflammation, loss of connection, uh, loss of social status, etc, etc. Now, if we look at the statistics of global depression, so let's just say there's 7 billion people in the world and 7 billion people in the world and there is probably somewhere between 5 and 10% of the world's population that have suffered or are suffering from depression. Right? That's pretty high odds. 
Good morning. morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Excellent. Enjoy your run. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, there's probably between 5 and 10% of the global population that is suffering from depression. That's pretty high odds. And I think that as a nation of people, we have to start asking these questions as to why. Why is depression such a theme in our society? And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what my opinions on that could be. Now, depression is not a weakness. It's not a glitch in the matrix. It's not that you've got something wrong with you. And it's certainly not that you're crazy. Far from it. And also, if you've ever suffered from depression or know somebody with depression, one of the worst things you can say to them is, oh, you'll snap out it or just give yourself a shake or why don't you take yourself off for a couple of days and do something that you really enjoy? Now, that's actually like shooting a depressed person with an arrow and is far from helpful. So from my perspective, looking at depression... When we start to look at other significant indicators of depression, bees have evolved to be in a hive. Human beings have evolved to be in a tribe. We are probably second generation that have dumped that tribal community feeling. Now, human beings have an enormous... Uh, strength if you like and it's when faced with adversity we huddle together as a community and we do what needs to be done in order to survive right so have you ever thought have you ever thought um you know like when you've been snowed in or there's been a big snowstorm or something like that that you've actually really enjoyed it because of the camaraderie of your neighbours and you're all out shoveling and you begin to help push the neighbour's car up the driveway, etc, etc. If what I'm saying resonates with you, then listen on. As a species, our superpower, the strength that we have is when faced with adversity, we all go back to that original mindset, which is herdal, which is tribal, which is community. Right now, we're faced with a pandemic. Now, for the most part of it, our community, this small community in Lanark, has really banded together to get things done, to do things for other people. And even if we have issues with some of the team members and all the rest of it that we would normally have avoided, in an adverse situation like this, such as COVID-19, We've got together, we've put our differences to side and we've actually worked very well as a team in organising and orchestrating the jobs that needed to be done to service the most vulnerable people that are in our communities. Now, why am I talking about this in depression? Because for the most of the time we've been told that, oh, depression, it's in your genes. My understanding, genes do not cause addiction and genes do not cause depression Genes do not cause anything. However, there is a part of the gene which then makes us susceptible to addiction or depression, okay? So depression is not only a biological marker and as long as we go to look at that, we're going to keep going round the same circle and coming up with the same results and looking at the same solutions, which frankly, are not working. Now, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we all have a need to be, we all have a need to have food, to have shelter, to have clean air, etc. And if I were to take any of those things away from you, if those things were to be taken away from you, we'd be in trouble very, very quickly. But in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what I'm suggesting we do with Maslow's triangle is we actually turn it upside down and we start to look at what was below the food, the shelter. We are looking at what are the psychological needs of this species, the human being. The psychological need that we have 
Good morning, good morning, morning, people saying good morning, good morning. The psychological needs that we have, such as connection, group working, feeling like we belong, these markers are as important as any biological marker that somebody would look at when they're attempting to diagnose depression. I get that depression is a very, very, very debilitating disease. And when you're in it, it's very hard to get yourself out to do the counterintuitive move that it really needs in order for you to start to work with your depression. Now, when you look at the society of which we inhabit, the society of which we inhabit, the machine, the capitalist machine that's been created, has been created to actually value disconnection and separation over what it does connection. It, if, if we look at what people do when they feel any form of weakness, if you're in a tribe where you think that buying, okay, I've got a German sports car, I've got an Italian suit, and I've got a Swiss watch, and you try and buy your way out of feeling depressed, that's not going to work, and in fact, it's only going to make it work because you'll sit looking out your office window at your German sports car, looking at the time on your Swiss watch and taking off and hanging up your Swiss, uh, your, your Italian jacket and still feeling lost and empty inside and then start to attack yourself more for look at all of what I've got. I still feel depressed, disconnected, lost. Now, depression that seems to be taken over this world there is one common thread that seems to run through the majority of cases and that is a perceived feeling of loneliness whether that's true or not it's the perception that I am alone that I am lonely now we're very apt at being able to prescribe medication to people um, we've become experts in the fields of coming up with and patenting new drugs to combat new illnesses but sometimes what it takes is actually just to listen to a person and hear what it is that's actually going on with them now through this COVID-19 through this COVID-19 there's a huge amount of worry about loss of jobs and loss of employment and loss of social status jobs simply aren't going to be there for people now, even if you were, look at this from a thought, let's just say you were going along to your work. People, if you are lonely, you are more inclined to get depression. If you're in a job where you feel that you don't have any control or you're in a relationship where you don't feel as if you've got any control or indeed you're in a life where you feel as if you don't have any control, you're more likely to get depression. So let's just imagine this is a theory at the moment that you've been going along to a job that you've sort of 25 to 50% liked, but not really fully enjoyed it. And then along came a pandemic, you've been put on furlough and you've came back and the stress is lifted. You start to feel a whole lot better. But now it's looming that in two or three weeks time, you're going to be getting put back into the arena, back into the bull ring back to the place of employment that wasn't really fully aligned with you but you've also not got the coaching the understanding of what it is that you really want to be doing because you've been doing this particular job that's been 25 to 50 percent all right for 10 20 30 years right so then what starts to happen is we start to anticipate furlough ending we're starting to anticipate this coming to an end we're starting to anticipate having to go back to a job that we don't like morning gordon we anticipate going back to a job that we don't like and all of a sudden we're going to be filled with anxiety and depression because we start to put ourselves further and further and further out 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 of the out of the paradigm that we should be entering back into so what I suggest people do when we're looking at depression is not to look at the chemical imbalance in the brain because that's not a camp that I sit in. I don't believe that fully. 
And what I would suggest you do if you want to research depression, I would suggest you look at the hippocampus. It sounds like hippopotamus, but it's hippocampus of the brain of people that are suffering from depression versus those that are not. And really what the antidepressant medication may be doing is, rather than giving you a flood of serotonin to make you feel better, it may be giving you a flood of serotonin, which is then enabling neurogenesis to occur in the hippocampus of the brain and allow your brain to start to function differently, which would actually then indicate that depression is not a chemical imbalance in the brain and that depression is something more. Now, what we could start to look at is the other indicators of depression. Indicators of depression such as loneliness, isolation, feeling like we don't belong, feeling like we don't fit in, feeling that we can't expose ourselves through risk where there's a lack of trust. Now, as I said, bees have evolved to hive together. Human beings have evolved to tribe together. Now, for the last sort of my generation and probably the generation before, well, mostly my generation, we've completely turned our back on that primitive um, social need that we have. Because back when I was a wee kid, we never had, a lot of us never had phones even in our house. A lot of our pals never had phones even in our house. So it wasn't like you could phone them up and see what they were doing. You actually had to get out of your house, go down and chop their door and be like, hey, you coming out to play today. That doesn't happen any longer. We are entering and have been entering into a very cold and very isolated world based on technology rather than human connection and human interaction. And I, I, I see that as the uppermost when treating depression is actually what we should be doing is social prescribing. We live in a world where junk food and junk beliefs and junk values. I was thinking about this last night as I was lying in my bed and there was a book I read in the early 90s, uh, Jack Canfield's book, uh, what was it called? Chicken Soul for the Soup. Now in 2020, there should be a book that's pretty much out that's Burger King for the Soul or, you know, KFC for the Soul or McDonald's for the Soul. Because pretty much the way that we are feeding our primitive social needs is the way that we are feeding our gut with junk food. We're, we're going out and we're buying expensive possessions to post on Instagram to get OMG, I'm so jealous. We're posting things that we get on Facebook in order to get the likes from other people because we can't really feel it. We go out and we buy a new car rather than going out and enjoying it and putting the cruise control on and sitting at 55 mile an hour and going for a run round the, round the countryside, the first thing we do is we take a picture of it and put it in social media to see how many likes we can get. Then that was what we would indicate our value on. We're putting our value on external sources. We're putting our value on what people say on Instagram. OMG, I'm jealous. W-O-W, -O -W, can't believe you've got that. And as I've said, people that try and buy their way out of depression is only digging themselves a, a bigger hole. You've got the German sports car, you've got the Swiss watch, you've got the Italian suit, yet Phil, still I feel empty and disabled in myself. There must be something really wrong with me when I've got all this and I can't, I can't appreciate it, I can't enjoy it. No, there's not anything wrong with you. Your depression's not any worse than anybody else's. What you're actually experiencing is a total and utter lack of connection to the self. Now, in a world that honours and values separation in this capitalist system, it's extremely difficult to try and find some kind of social prescribing. Now, people are less likely. Look at the statistics. People who exercise are less likely, are less susceptible to addiction. People that uh, walk or go out in nature look at this, are less likely to suffer from depression. People who are part of groups and can work together as an effective team where they feel honoured, where they feel trusted enough to speak, are less susceptible to depression. So why don't we look at social prescribing rather than the first thing we do? And as I said yesterday, I am anti-pharmaceutical. 
but I genuinely think there is a place for pharmaceutical medication and interventions, absolutely. If I had a motorcycle accident, I don't want somebody coming in uh, teaching me gardening or telling me to go a walk in nature or indeed covering my wound in lavender oil and throwing Reiki symbols all over me. I want pharmaceutical intervention. But it's a very fine line between using the pharmaceutical intervention as a temporary solution and avoiding the cause. It's the cause that we need to be looking at rather than rather than avoiding that cause. And if we need an antidepressant or we need a pharmaceutical intervention in order to get us across the threshold to then start to uh, and for then to then start allowing us to get out the house to connect with peer groups to connect with other people to get us to the gym to get us out exercising to get us out doing more things in nature and then we look at starting to slowly taper down the antidepressant that is a solution focused intervention rather than the band-aid that unfortunately because we don't have the time the resources the money the financial implications of what it's going to take to socially prescribe to people Imagine what it would be like if we took a group of 10 individuals that were suffering from depression and rather than giving them antidepressants, or indeed their own antidepressants, right? And what we did with them was we got them into some kind of um, natural activity, right? Something that you need to work as a team. That could be hill climbing or it could be, that's pretty dangerous, but kayaking, that's pretty dangerous as well. Gardening, right? Let's just imagine that we got a little plot of ground with some beautiful microbial, microbial rich soils. And what we did was we socially prescribed these 10 individuals to sit in a group, 10 individuals that were all depressed and they're not allowed to talk about their depression. They're to talk about things that they actually enjoy and how that they're going to problem solve in order to even build the polytunnel and start researching what it would be like to, to create raised planters and what sort of seeds would need to be planted at what sort of time and how the natural rhythms would Right, so imagine you've got 10 people, you've got them in a room, they're all depressed, and you start to socially prescribe, um, you start to socially describe interventions that actually have a community, a tribe at its heart. How do you think that would go? Well, we need to start looking and we need to start trying these things. And um, depression, I could talk about that forever. It's such an interesting subject. But at the core of depression, I feel, and um, I feel that a lot of illnesses, traumas and disease that we have is a spiritual, it's a loss of spiritual connection. I was thinking as well, when I, before I was doing this talk, one of the great things about doing these vlogs is that it allows me to get out my comfort zone, get out of the bed early in the morning. And rather than talking to a camera, which I don't enjoy, It gets me out, it gets me out into nature. And this is the most beautiful eight mile trek I do every morning uh, before I go in the river. But what I started, when I started thinking about this, I started thinking about natural rhythms and cycles of the world and how my mindset has improved over the years. <clears throat> I could share a personal story with you. Um, I, had the I had my very first electrocenophonograph in my brain taken in 2010 uh, by a guy called uh, Martin Wicke. And what that brain EEG showed was that I had very high beta activity and extremely low alpha, right? And I went through a program. I went there because I did a motorcycle accident, I had a bisymmetrical brain injury, and that was the very first EEG I ever had. And then I was over and... Uh, no, I wasn't. Uh, another friend of mine, Dr. Antonio Marawo, he took... He's been on and chatted with me. He took an EEG in my brain. Again, looked at my brain, exact same EEG. Uh, high beta, uh, no alpha, low, no alpha, right? Went to a neuroscience convention in um, Holland, uh, 2014. So this was like over a three-year period. A uh, guy that invented Brain Master, works high, Dr. Thomas Kalur, took an EEG in my brain. Again, very high beta, very low alpha. It wasn't until I had a conversation with Antonio Marawa that he said, do you suffer from anxiety? And I said, no. And he said, and what Dr. Tom Kalur said to me went, do you smoke marijuana? And I went, not now, but it was my drug of choice. I said, what made you ask me that? He said, because you have no alpha in your brain. 
he said, and marijuana increases alpha, so you would be susceptible to marijuana use. And I was like, wow, oh my God, right? So looking back over my brainwave activity, I was then looking at my brain, which was a brain of a highly anxious stroke could be depressed person. But I genuinely never felt that because that was my normal state. I didn't know, I didn't know any other way. It's like somebody that was born with no arms and no legs doesn't know what it's like to have arms and legs. I'm sorry for being so cruel there, but I don't know any other way. So prolonged drug use could have caused my brainwave activity to look the way that it did, or being brought up in a highly stressed, highly traumatic um, environment in my earliest of development could then have made me more susceptible to alcohol or drug use. Now, it's very much a chicken and an egg. I'm never going to have known which one came first, but the general consensus would be that I was more susceptible to drug use because of being in a very uh, fight or flight mode in my earliest of development, right? So working through depression myself, or indeed anxiety myself, and I was sitting here and I was thinking about what I was going to say this morning. About a year or so ago, um, I got introduced to cold water immersion wild swimming right so i went down to london to see this guy who everybody's buzzing about just now last february february 2019 february 2019 and i got myself in the river most days for a year if not every day it was at least two three times a week minimum now more than the cold water immersion what i noticed through that time was I would go to the same place on the same day, the same time. I would lie in the river and I would look around me at nature. And what I got to see was I got to notice the changing seasons and how on a daily basis something would change. I would get to see the way and I started to become, through my day-to-day -day living, I started to become more observant of moon cycles, cycles in weather, how things were acting. So although I was becoming more what it felt like, more attuned with my external world, what I was thinking about last night was that was an opportunity for me to become more attuned with my internal world. Now, if you've got depression, you're disconnected from that internal world. You're disconnected and there's a place of isolation. Even if that's true or not, there's a perceived sense of loneliness a perceived sense of not belonging. So rather than going down the pharmaceutical route and going down the route that Western people have been uh, forged to believe that depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain, I would encourage all of you to do your research on other indicative factors of depression that would not highlight that you've got an imbalance in your brain, that you have got something wrong with you, that you are weak or that you are crazy. That is not the case. You're not crazy. You're not weak. It's not a kind of disease or illness that you should just get over and pull yourself through it. That's not the case. It's very real. It's extremely debilitating. And, going, and, and, and if it goes untreated, it can lead to detrimental effects in the human psyche, such as suicide, leaving family members, etc. behind. So if you are experiencing depression and you are watching this, I would really encourage you to reach out to charities that are working in the field of mental health, that are offering good and effective interventions. And if you really need to get to a doctor, and get pharmaceutical interventions in order to assist you getting through and getting to the next stage in your development. So thank you very much for listening. Have a fantastic Thursday and have a great day.